Mulia da There is no beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. There is no holy as the Lord, holy as the Lord. There is no holy as the Lord, as the Lord. There is none beside thee, beside thee, neither is there any room like our God. There is none holy as the Lord, holy as the Lord. There is none holy as the Lord, as the Lord. There is none beside thee, beside thee, neither is there any wrong like our God. There is none holy. There's none like you. You are greater than the greatest. You are higher than the highest. You are older than the oldest. You are wiser than the wisest. Father, you are stronger than the strongest. There's no one like you. Please accept our worship in Jesus' name. Today, in all our lives, please prove yourself again. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, wave your hand to one or two people and said, God himself will bless you mightily today. Amen. Well, we are continuing with our series on going higher as we move on to part 25 part 25 and our text today will be first king chapter 18 from verse 22 to 24 1 Kings 18, from verse 22 to 24. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only remain a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves and cut it in pieces and lay it on wood and put no fire under. And I will dress the other bullock and lay it on wood and put no fire under. And call ye on the name of your gods and I will call on the name of the Lord and the God that answered by fire let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. Hmm. When I was younger in the Lord, I used to think that when the Bible calls God the Lord of hosts, that he was talking about the angels alone, that God is the commander-in-chief of the angels. But as I grew in the Lord, I discovered that no, he's the commander-in-chief of all armies, armies in heaven, armies on earth, armies underneath the earth. 
As a matter of fact, I discovered that God says he has a great army made up of insects. Joel chapter 2, verse 25. Joel 2, verse 25. Locust, canker worm, caterpillar, and palma worm. They are all part of his great army, he said so. When he was promising to forgive and restore Israel, he said, I will restore to you the years that the locusts had eaten. The years the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palma, palma worm had eaten. He said, my great army that I sent among you. When you study the scriptures, you will discover that God can fight with frogs. Exodus chapter 8, verse 1 to 13. Exodus 8, 1 to 13. He can fight with lies. L-I-C-E. Exodus 8, verse 16 to 19. Exodus 8, 16 to 19. He can fight with flies. Exodus 8, from verse 20 to 31. Yes, he had. He has mighty armies. Angels. Insects. Birds, name them. But the very nature of God himself is fire. So if you are putting a subtitle to this one, it is God and fire. Because we hear Elijah saying here, the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. You need to know and you need to let it sink deeply into you as you are go going higher. The very nature of God is fire. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 29. Hebrews 12 verse 29. Our God is a consuming fire. Don't ever forget that. The closer you get to him, the more you must realize our God is a consuming fire. You need to get that deep into your heart so that you don't get uh, too casual with him. Our God is not Father Christmas. Never forget that. Oh, God is love. Ah, we, we all know that. It's written. But never forget that when you are dealing with God, you are dealing with fire. In Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, from verse 1 to 4, Acts 2, 1 to 4, on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came, it came as cloven tongues of fire. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 5, Revelation 4, verse 5, 
The Bible stated clearly, the seven lamps of fire represent the seven spirits of God. Fire, fire. In Exodus chapter 3, from verse 1 to 6, Exodus 3, from verse 1 to 6, when Moses saw a bush burning and the bush was not consumed, and he turned around to see, the Bible said God spoke to him out of that fire. He is fire. Discriminating fire. When he is dealing with his children, it's one kind of fire. When he's dealing with the enemies of his children, it's another kind of fire. Daniel chapter 3. From verse 19 to 27, Daniel 3, 19 to 27. The people who went to throw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego into the fairy furnace were slain by fire. His own children, <laughs> they were walking through the fire, strolling, having a conversation with the fourth man. God is invisible. His own fire is an invisible fire. But his fire all the same. Judges chapter 15, from verse 11 to 14. Judges 15, 11 to 14. When they brought something bound to the Philistines, and the Philistines began to rejoice, the Bible said the Holy Spirit came down mightily on Samson. And the only thing that got burnt were the ropes that bound him. God is fire. Discriminating fire. I'm praying today that the fire of God will come down. And everything that is not of God in your life will be consumed. It is because his nature is fire. Because he's very, very jealous of the fact that he is fire. That's why in Leviticus chapter 10 from verse 1 to 2. Let Leviticus 10 verse 1 to 2. When the sons of Aaron brought straight fire into the temple, God killed them straight away. It's a great lesson, a great warning to those who may want to bring straight fires into the church of the living God. They are playing with death. His nature is fire. Get that one clear. Number two, he made fire for his purpose. That is the physical fire that you see. You know, he made all things. John chapter 1 from verse 1 to 3. John 1, 1 to 3. And one of the principal reasons he made fire is for purification. Malachi chapter 3, verse 3. Those of you who want to go high, pay attention. Malachi 3, verse 3. He said, he's going to purify the sons of Levi. He will sit down as a refiner of silver and gold and pass the sons of of Levi through fire to purify them. Why? Because 
when gold is passed through fire, it becomes purer gold. Job chapter 23, verse 10. Job 23, verse 10. Job said, when he has tried me, I will come forth as gold. When he has passed me through fire, I will come out as pure as gold. First Peter chapter 1, verse 7. First Peter chapter 1, verse 7. The Bible tells us that your faith must be tried by fire. I hope I'm not frightening anybody. <laughs> but you said last Sunday you want to be I only. You want to reach the top. The gold that the Almighty God is going to use has to be the purest kind of gold. And gold is purified by fire. It will amaze you if you now read with understanding Exodus chapter 12 from verse 1 to 10. Exodus 12 verse 1 to 10. When the Lord was telling Moses how to prepare the meat for the Passover, he said, it must be roasted by fire. He said, don't boil it. Roast it by fire. He said, any bit of it that you could not finish that night, burn the rest by fire. Fire. So he, he created fire for purification, particularly of those were his own. But he also created fire, sends down fire occasionally to show his approval. To show his acceptance of offering. Judges chapter 6 from verse 11 to 22. Judges 6 11 to 22, he said to Gideon, Hey, you are a mighty man of valor, and I have an assignment for you. And that one said, Well, if that is true, let me give you an offering. Let me prepare some food for you. You know the rest of the story. He prepared the food, he said, Pour it on the rock, he poured it on the rock, he touched it with the staff in his hand, and fire came. Hmm. In Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 1, Second Chronicles 7, verse 1, when Solomon finished praying, that's after he built a beautiful house for God, and then prepared an offering for God in Second Chronicles 5, 13 to 14, Second Chronicles 5, 13 to 14. And he prayed, dedicating the house of God. God wanted him to know, yes, son, I approved of what you have done. I accept your offering. He sent down fire. That's very important. Get that one settled in your mind. If we're going to be a great vessel unto God, you will pass through fire. The difference between steel and iron is how long each one has stayed in the fire. And I remember telling those of us who are older that a general will not carry a sword to battle that has not been in the fire for a long time. 
Because fire must remove everything that is not 100% pure from that sword. You don't want a sword that will break in the day of trouble. You want a sword that will last. But the point I want to make, I want to go a little deeper for all of us who are determined to reach whatever height God can make available to man, is this. In 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 1, 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 1, when God spoke to Elijah, what he said is, go and show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain. He didn't say, I will send fire. He said, I will send rain. So how come now that Elijah was saying, God will send fire? Because that's what he was saying. The God that answered by fire, let him be God. This is introducing you to something called the ministry of the prophet. And I pray that the Holy Spirit himself will circumcise your ears so you hear correctly and not jump to wrong conclusions. There is a difference between someone who can prophesy and someone who is a prophet. A prophet, real prophet, chosen by God. <laughs> Has a ministry that is different from just anybody. They have a higher intimacy with God. They hear the inaudible. They hear what others don't hear. For example, take Moses. In Exodus chapter 14, from verse 15 to 18, Exodus 14, verse 15 to 18, when the uh, army of Pharaoh was pursuing the children of Israel, the children of Israel just saw Moses lifting up his hand against the Red Sea, and the Red Sea parted. They did not hear when God said to Moses, raise your hand against the sea. Only Moses had that one. As a matter of fact, I'm sure when he stood before the Red Sea and lifted up his hand and he rod against the Red Sea, the children of Israel would be wondering, what's he doing? It will amaze you that there is nowhere else before then that God has told anybody that when you want to cross a, a sea, <laughs> raise your hand. So if you two get to the lagoon and you say, hey, lagoon, can you see my hand? Part, attempt it. Maybe somebody will rescue you before you have drunk in too many gallons or liters of water. In Second Kings chapter two, verse nineteen to twenty-two. Second Kings chapter two, verse nineteen to twenty-two. When Elisha, when the people of Jericho came to Elisha and they said, Sir, we have a problem. 
our city is beautiful, but uh, the, the ground is barren, and there's a lot of death here. He said, go and bring me salt in a new container. And he took the salt and applied it to the source of the river, and uh, the problem was solved. Where did he learn that? Has Elijah ever done anything like that before? Because he was brought up by Elijah. Where is it written before in the scriptures that if there is a curse upon a city, all you need to do is take salt and throw it into the river and everything will be okay. Where was he written before? But he heard. Elisha had God say, son, this is the solution. When you read 2 Kings chapter 4, from verse 38 to 41, 2 Kings 4, 38 to 41, the Bible said, Elisha wanted to feed the sons of the prophets, and he asked somebody to prepare the food, and somebody went out and brought in some poisonous uh, herbs, added it to the food, and when they tasted the food and they found that it was poisonous, they cried unto Elisha, Sir, there is death in the pot. The man of God did not pray. He simply said, bring me some flour. They brought him some flour. He threw it into the pot. The poison disappeared. Where did he learn that? He didn't learn it. He heard. He had the inaudible. Hmm. Not all disciples have that kind of intimacy with God. Not all. I mean, like we told you before, in John chapter 13 from verse 21 to 26, John 13, 21 to 26, when Jesus said somebody was going to betray him and they beckoned to John to ask, the Bible said John was leaning on the bosom of Jesus Christ. What Jesus Christ said to him was not heard by the others. Jesus whispered to him, I'm going to take a piece of bread, I'm going to dip it in the stew, I'm going to put it in the mouth of the traitor. Jesus wasn't shouting. It was a discussion between two friends. It will interest you to know that the Bible says in Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, it says, He who has ear to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. That means not everybody has hearing here. The Bible tells us that when God wants to speak to his prophets, he's speaking small, still voice. Others won't hear. Hmm. Is it not surprising that the last book of the Bible, the book that contains details of things that will happen in the last day, have been reserved for only one person? John the Beloved, Revelation chapter 1, from verse 1 to 7. Revelation 1, 1 to 7. When you get sufficiently close to God, 
God will begin to whisper things to you that if you announce it, people may not even believe you. I could still remember the surprise on the faces of my people. That only goes service in June of a particular year. When we came for the Holy Ghost service, and I said to everybody, hey, shake hands with one or two people and say, Happy New Year. Happy New Year in June. What does that mean? What's he saying? Fortunately, they trust me enough to be able to say, okay, if he says so, <laughs> Happy New Year. By the following Monday, we knew what God was talking about. The history of Nigeria has not been the same since then. Now, there's one important point here. Ah. If God ever takes you to that level of intimacy with him. If you can begin to hear the inaudible, you will begin very soon to do the impossible. That's very important. Here you can read Second King chapter 6 from verse 8 to 23. 2 Kings 6, 8 to 23. You know the story? One king wanted to capture the king of Israel, and as he's holding his meeting, Elisha will stay in his room and hear everything. The king then follows. It wasn't long after that that the king said, go and get him. And the whole army came. And Elisha arrested them and led them to enemy territory. If you can begin to hear that still, small voice of God, hmm. so soon you begin to do the impossible. And let me close today by saying, ah, to really become a prophet, true prophet, you will need a kiss of fire. Isaiah chapter 6, from verse 1 to 8. Isaiah 6, from verse 1 to 8. Isaiah said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the invisible. I saw the king of kings. I saw him lifted high. His train filled the temple. And then I took a look at myself and I saw how dirty I've been. Oh, he's been prophesying before then. <laughs> <laughs> He's the one who said, Say ye to the righteous, it shall be well with him. He was prophesying. But after he said, He said, My lips are unclean. You can prophesy with unclean lips. But if you are going to be the real prophet, <laughs> your lips must be cleansed. And it was cleansed by fire. It was only then. That God said to him, who shall I send? Who will go for me? And he said, ah, I'm here, Lord, send me. When you consider how many books, how many chapters of prophecy that Elijah gave after that taste of fire, you will see the difference between a ministry of a prophet, and somebody who can just prophesy. 
So the message of today is only for those who, who really want to go really, really deep. There is a God who can answer by fire because he himself is fire. And your lips might need a little kiss of fire. But if this is for <laughs> those who are already children of God, what about those who are not yet children of God? I said it earlier. The fire of God is discriminated discriminate between those who are his own and those who are not his own. Those who went to throw Shedra, Meshach, and Abednego into the fire, fire burnt them. Whereas his children walked out of fire purer than ever before. As a matter of fact, they came out of the fire to be promoted. So the choice is yours. Do you want the fire of God to consume you? Or you want the fire of God to purify you? The, the, the difference is between are you a child of God or are you not? And whether we like it or not, anyway, fire is coming. Whenever the fire comes, it will purify God's own people and consume those who are not his own. So if you want to escape the fire of the judgment of God, come to him today. Surrender your life right now. If you are near, if you are near an altar, rush to the altar. If you are sitting down in your home, this is a moment when you must really, really make up your mind. If the fire of God falls, I want you to purify me, not consume me. If you don't want the fire of God to consume you, hmm, cry to Jesus Christ for salvation now, and he will save your soul. Let us pray. If you want to surrender your life to the Lord, call on him. I say, Lord Jesus, have mercy on me. Save my soul. Let your blood wash away my sins. I want to be a member of your family. So when your fire falls, it will purify me and not consume me. And those of us who are already children of the living God, I hope you'll be able to cry unto God and say, Holy Ghost fire. Fire fall on me. As on the day of Pentecost, fire fall on me. Let us pray. My Father, my God, I want to bless your holy name for your word again. Thank you for all those who are surrendering their life to you now. Please receive them. Save their souls. Let your blood wash away their sins. Please, Lord, receive them into the family of God so that when the fire of God falls, it will only purify them and not consume them. And as for those who are already your children, like never before, let the Holy Ghost and fire fall on each and every one of them so that they can be purified, so they can come forth as gold. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. How oh, I want to rejoice with those of you who have given your life to Jesus Christ today. I want to assure you that by the grace of God, I will keep on praying for you. So I would love to hear from you. I would love to know your names, your address, your prayer requests, so I can be praying for you. And I will advise you to seek out any branch of the Redeemed Christian Church of God. They are all around you. And tell the pastor, I've given my life to Jesus and I want to know what to do next. God bless you.